If you have or suspect you may have a health problem, or if you require answers to specific health care questions or concerns, you should consult your physician or health care provider and not depend solely on information presented in this program. Hello, I'm Dr. Steve Garner. Welcome to Ask the Doctor. This series was created to assist you in understanding medical issues so you can take charge of your own health. This is our eighth season and we are airing once a week. This is a live call-in show, so have your phones nearby. In case you don't get through, you can still submit your questions via the internet. Visit netny.net slash askthedoctor and let me know what's on your mind. I'll take those questions for future discussion. For this episode, I have Dr. Barbara Capozzi, a family practitioner and professor of osteopathic medicine at Toro College. Then I have Dr. Ivan Grimberger, the chief of the Department of Urology at New York Methodist Hospital. And lastly, we have Dr. Daniel Stevens, a laparoscopic surgeon from Manhattan. Welcome. And this is um, quite a show we have, so I, I, I'm excited myself, actually. I think if I were home, I'd be watching this show, too. So we have some great news for, as far as medicine in the news, and then we're going to get right to our guests. First, of course, I always like to acknowledge the presence of Monsignor Bennett, who hasn't missed one show, not one show, Monsignor, right? Hasn't missed a show. So thank you for coming. And um, in the news, a new test for diabetes. Not really a new test the way it's labeled, but in the past, if, if you wanted to find out if you had diabetes, you'd go for a blood test, a fasting blood sugar, or you'd drink this very, very sugary stuff, and then they, they call it a glucose tolerance test. And doctors now at the, at the National Diabetes Meeting that's happening this very week feel that the best way to determine if someone has diabetes is a test called hemoglobin A1C. And this is a special type of hemoglobin that ri rises in, in the number when you have more sugar floating around, when you don't have proper control. And this, the, the benefit of this test is that it gives a three-month average of how your sugar has been. So you can't fool the doctor and one day, you know, watch what you eat and you go in and the, and the test looks good or if it looks particularly bad on one day, you, the doctor won't get fooled. This is an average of three months. So make sure your doctor gets this hemoglobin A1C test, and we'll put it on the website so you know what to ask for. Now, another study came out this week that showed that children, I'm talking about seven, eight, six-year-olds, about one out of four are sleep deprived. They have sleep problems, everywhere, everything from sleep apnea to wetting the bed um, to, to allergies and to sleepwalking. And it never was assumed that so many children were affected. The previous thoughts were that maybe about 1%. But it's beginning to mirror the adult population. And what's bad about this is as you become sleep deprived, it also throws off your regulation as to how much you eat. And you tend to want to eat more. And this may be related to the rise in obesity that we're seeing in children. So it's important for the pediatrician to, to quiz the mother, to ask, have the mother speak to the child about sleep habits. And there are ways to retrain a person to have better sleep habits. So it's very important. So no matter what the age, the doctor should be looking for this. Now the other thing, how many of you, you know, don't have this, right, the cell phone? And there's a new phenomena out now called cell phone elbow. Like Dr. Grunberg was telling me, he had tennis elbow. That's of the tendons. But actually, when you hold the, your phone like this and you're on this for a long period of time, the elbow is bent. And it cuts off the blood supply to the ulnar nerve which is running down, it's like the funny bone when you hit yourself and it gives you a shock and it hits the fifth finger and the ring finger. Doing this for long periods of time can create weakness in the fingers, numbness and tingling. I don't know how many of you out there have it. I see one hand up, but uh, it's, it really can create this problem. So if you're on the phone a lot and you're feeling this numbness and tingling, the best thing to do is either get a headset or to alternate hands. Don't use just the right or the left hand. What do you think is the most common hand for people to hold the cell phone with? Quick question, not the, not the trivia question. It's probably the right hand. The right hand is correct. I'm a left, I'm a righty, but uh, most people hold it with their right hand. So try and, you know, switch back and forth. And finally, is chronic fatigue syndrome real? And doctors believe that this is a real syndrome. Many people out there may be having symptoms of just severe fatigue, not, ju not just feeling a little tired, but overwhelming fatigue after periods of moderate exercise, feeling of depression, feeling of swelling of the joints, uh, loss of appetite, trouble digesting, very 
easily susceptible to becoming intoxicated from alcohol. So there's a number of things out there, and a lot of these people were labeled as malingerers because the doctors did not believe it was a real syndrome. Now there's help, possible help on the way. A drug called Amplogen may be approved this week, and it helps to regulate the immune system of the body, which may be the underlying cause of chronic fatigue syndrome. So I, you, there's a lot more that I wrote about in this week's tablet, so you look at it for this Sunday when you're in church, and for those who know people, you know, assure them that this is a real signal si uh, disease and that help may be on the way. Now, I have a, uh, we got a question, and we have a, something that I'm very proud of. One of our doctors, Dr. Capozzi, who's with us tonight, is a writer for this magazine. What's the name of the magazine? The Boulevard. The Boulevard. And you can get this in the Hamptons, and Long Island, and New York City, and on the internet. And there's really amazing stories in here about your health. And Dr. Capozzi has written an article called Revolutionary, Possible Revolutionary Cure for Cancer. And it's a fascinating article. We're not going to read it tonight, but it's something that I would like people in the audience to get, to read. You can see it online. How, how could they get it online? You can go to www.boulevardli.com, access the magazine, and click on to whatever article you'd like to read. It's a fascinating story. And Thank you. we have a question, actually, from the website. And the person wants to know, Tarina, her name is, about an article that she had read and saw on, on Fox about putting a tube in the portion of the digestive tract called the duodenum. And putting this plastic tube in, it seemed to cure diabetes. And I know we have Dr. Stevens here who's very familiar with laparoscopic approach to surgery. Do you know, um, can you uh, give us well, any? Well, this is really an evolution of bariatric or weight loss surgery. You know, it started probably in the 50s with big open surgeries. And it's evolved to laparoscopic surgery, which is small incisions. And now it's evolving even further to incisionless procedures which is through the mouth and through the esophagus and into the stomach. This particular operation or procedure inserts a plastic sleeve which uh, coats part of the digestive tract, the first portion of the small intestine. And what it does is that it sort of acts like a gastric bypass in a way in that it allows your food to go through that sleeve, it's a plastic sleeve, and not, uh, not mix with the enzymes uh, which are given off by the pancreas so the food doesn't get absorbed in that portion of the small intestine. So you lose weight that way. There are advantages and disadvantages to that procedure. You know, the long-term results of this procedure aren't out yet, but it definitely has been proven effective, possibly in the short term. Fantastic. So, and we'll get you the, the study where this is being done, the, the location. So if you want to enter that study, Tarina, this, we'll get you that information on our website. And now let's meet our doctors. You met Dr. Capozzi. I know that you're, you're great with patients, but now you're in a different phase of uh, your professional career. Tell the right. audience what you're doing. Right. Actually, what I'm doing right now is there's a new osteopathic medical school in Harlem, and I'm working there as the clinical systems coordinator, and it's very exciting. We have our inaugural class getting ready to go out to the rotations. So they just took their first part of their boards, or they're taking them in the next couple of months, and we have our third class coming in. So I teach there, and I do a lot of administrative work, and I'm just loving it. It's a great, the school is unique. We have a unique mission statement, and that is to serve the underserved populations. So it's really, it's just a wonderful program. And I know what Dr. Capozzi is great at is also nutrition and how to deal yeah. with some of the complementary part of medicine, not just the, the, um, the things that you would get from a regular doctor, but some of the differences, some acupuncture or other treatments that might be useful, and we'll get into that in a little while. Okay, great. Dr. Grunberger, this is your first visit. It's a pleasure to have you here. Yeah, it's great to um, be here. One of New York's best doctors, right, according to New York Magazine and according to those who know him. He's actually my, my doctor, too, so he's one of my favorites. And I know that you're always written about by Dennis, ha Dennis Hamill, who's one of a great column writer for the, um, for the news. Yes, and it's always nice that he mentions me on his uh, annual <laughs> Christmas uh, letter. Yeah, how much did that cost? <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I know you're making a trip to Napa Valley. Yeah, we're, um, next month, my, my wife, my wife and I will be celebrating our 20th anniversary, and um, so that's 20 that's years, wow. And you know, know what's great? You're going to be making the journey back to Brooklyn. You moved out to New Jersey for a little while. You're going to be coming back. Yeah, once the kids graduate from college. That's great. So we're going to deal with all the urology questions, both men and women, right? And I know there's a lot of controversy about prostate screening that maybe we can get into, and, and it's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks for having Thank me. Thank you. Dr. Daniel Stevens has been with us before several times and 
one of our favorite guests. Thank you. How are you doing? And I understand you're also heading out to Napa Valley. I am. It's uh, Dr. Grunberger's 20th anniversary. It's my first oh, anniversary. Oh, wow, wow. He's got some years on me here, but uh, we're going out there as well for a little vacation. You know, times have changed. My first anniversary went to Hoboken. He's <laughs> heading out to Napa, Napa. I don't know what this is about, but um, I hope you have a great time out Thanks. there. And um, you've also settled into the city, right? Yes, we have. That's uh, great. Very happy. Very good. So we've got a great show, and we're going to be talking about laparoscopic surgery, what it is, um, why it's better than previous uh, surgeries, the typical surgeries where you get cut with a knife, you know, how this is different. Right. So it's fantastic. I'm just I'm really looking forward to this. And before we're going to go to commercial, before we go to break, we're going to do a, qu a quick quiz, okay? And this is the Dr. Eugene Hagawara. He's our quiz master. He comes up with us every week. And he, we have to send out a congratulations. He just passed his radiology boards. So we want to congratulate him on that. But he assures us he's going to continue to do this quiz. So this is the question now. There's a word said, S-A-I-D, common word. There's also a word raid, R-A-I-D. Both end in A-I-D, but don't rhyme, right? Said and, and raid don't rhyme. There's another word ending in A-I-D that doesn't rhyme with either, either one of those two that I mentioned, said or raid. What is the other word ending in A-I-D that does not rhyme with either said or raid? Again, the, the stimulus, the motivation for this is the plaque that you receive for answering this question. Genuine handmade in Japan by many, many people working on this plaque. And it comes within two or three days after you get it. So, and, and we have one other, so that's one. And then the other suspense, we always look to see who's the first caller of the night. And now there's been a contest between Madeline, Anna, and Joel. So take your bets at home now and let's see who the first caller is. Hello? Hey. Who is it? It's me, Maddie. Maddie made it in again. And this is uh, for those at home that had Joel that, and Dan. Uh, I'm sorry. On that uh, game that you're playing, could it be said? No, no. It was said was one of the words. Said? S-A-I-D? That is one of the words. Said and, and raid. But that's not the word we're looking for. We're looking for a word that doesn't rhyme with said oh, or, I see. or raid. Oh, okay. But anyway, Maddie, what can we do for you? Yeah. I want to know, me, me and my friends... What we have problems, we have problems with our bowel movement, and we'd like to know what kind of food could we eat inside instead of taking pills. Okay, I'm gonna ask Dr. Okay. Capozzi. How do you stay regular? Sure. What kind of foods? Yeah. Before foods, I would say to make sure that you take in about six to eight glasses of water a day, because if you don't take in the adequate amount of water, yeah, I think the stool's I don't drink much out. water. Okay, that's the first thing that I would recommend, Maddie, is to increase the, your Six to eight glasses of water a day. Not all at once, but throughout the day. I'm 88. I'm so, you're 88? Yeah. That's wonderful. I never thought I'd reach the age. She's really 90, but uh, no, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> well, that's great, Maddie. When's your birthday? January the 20th. Okay, so wishes for an early happy birthday. Yeah, it's about half a year you. away, but happy thank birthday. You. Thank so you so much. That's the first thing I would do. The second thing I would do is to make sure that you eat your fresh fruits and vegetables. Okay, don't cook them too well steam them or parboil them or grill them and the other thing that you can do is to make sure you get enough fiber in is to possibly have a bowl of oatmeal in the morning for breakfast uh -huh. okay but the, the vegetables and the fruits and the whole grain products and try and stay away from those white like potatoes and white rice and the heavy starches Maddie thanks so much for the call thanks for being a loyal listener we'll see you later okay take care be well well we're gonna take a break now the number to call is 718-499-6101. You can talk about family medicine, urology, or laparoscopic surgery. So we'll take a short break, and when we come back, we'll go right to the phones. The phone number is 718-499-6101. We'll be right back. This is Broadcast Bulletin.
On the next Tapestry of Faith, we visit the Irish Apostolate. Then we go to the Indonesian Apostolate. Friday at 8 p.m. Hi, I'm Lorena. On Faith Film Festival, you'll see films of every kind. There's sadness, happiness, and everything in between. And we want to know what you think about them. Log on to www.netny.net backslash Faith Film Festival and give us your review. Well, welcome back, and let's go right to our busy phones because we want to get to as many questions as possible. The first person we have is Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Hi. And where are you calling from? Flatbush, Brooklyn. Oh, nice. Near the studio? We're down uh, in Park Slope. Not too far. That's good. What can we do for you? Uh, I have a question for Dr. Stevens. Um, I'm getting my gallbladder removed, and um, I have it scheduled. They told me they're going to do it with the laparoscopic or something like that. You know, they're making some holes. I looked it up on the Internet, and now I'm seeing I can get it done through one hole. And I want to know what that's about. Okay, so laparoscopic surgery for gallbladder and trying to cut down on the number of holes or incisions. Okay. Um, hi, Rachel. So what I think you're describing is again, an evolution of the surgical field. It's uh, an advancement in technology. And really what I think you might have heard is a uh, single incision surgery. Uh, laparoscopic surgery makes many or several small holes in the abdominal wall instead of one large hole to take out the gallbladder. Uh, a single incision makes one hole usually in the belly button or around the belly button and is similar to laparoscopic sur surgery. It's a type of laparoscopic surgery and you remove the gallbladder only through one through one incision. Uh, it's still somewhat experimental and it's not yet the standard of care for taking out your gallbladder. Uh, I'm not sure you know you can recommend it over laparoscopic surgery. It has some advantages. Maybe there's some decreased pain. Maybe the scars will be less than regular laparoscopic surgery. But I would talk to your doctor. If he's comfortable doing it the regular laparoscopic way, I would be comfortable with that. And uh, you could also get a second opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Hope that that helps. It's interesting. A whole new revolution. Are you using much laparoscopic surgery in your practice? Well, urologists becoming you know much more involved with laparoscopy, and and this the single port or one incision laparoscopy is becoming something that everyone's looking at. Interesting. And now we're going to go to we're going to go to line four. We have Patricia. Hi, Patricia. Hi. Where are you calling from? Uh, Massport, New York. Massport, New York. Now. I understand you have the winner. The, you think you have the winning uh, answer? Is that correct? Yes. Now don't say it yet. I just has anybody helped you with this quiz? No. Is that a, you? You hold your right hand up. Okay. Yes. Okay. What What is the answer? Blad P L A I D. Absolutely correct. How did that How did that come to you? <laughs> I don't know. Just the top of my head. <laughs> Amazing. All right, people here. We gave the quiz. Nobody could get that quiz. I, for days I have people working on that. That's fantastic. So plaid Thank doesn't... Thank you. <laughs> so now we need to get your name and number off the air and address, and the plaque should be in the mail to your house in about three days. Okay. Do you have a spot where you're going to put it? No, mm, probably on my wall in my bedroom. Okay, so every day you get up, you'll know, you remember your winner on Ask the Doc. You're only the fifth winner, only the fifth winner so far. Okay. So do you have any medical questions? Uh, not really. Uh, okay. okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Feel well. Thank you. Hi, Patricia. Okay, we're going to be sending it to her very soon. Hi, Ryan. Hello, good night. Hi, Ryan. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Canarsie. Oh, my, my daughters used to go to school in Canarsie. Do you have, a, you, are you there a long time? Yes, a very long time. But I, I called in last week. I'm the guy who called in last week with the brain problems that I was being electrocuted. Were you the one that had 13,000 volts go through your body? Yeah, 11,000. How many? Eleven. Eleven thousand. Yeah. Amazing story. Yes, and just to ref to recap, I, I think you were having problems with numbness and pain in your head. Yeah, and pain in the head and the, and thing, you know. But one of the things that I forgot to tell you all last week is that um, I find it like my body is out, out of thing. My timings and thing are not there with doing certain things. 
Uh -huh. And this is about five years after the electrocution? Oh, I got electrocuted since in 1994. 94, so it's about 15 years status post electrocution yeah. with 11,000 volts. And he's yeah. not quite right. He's, his head is he's off. He feels a little bit you know, out of sync, right? Yeah. So let me see what the doctors think. Um, Dr. Capozzi. Sure. Well, I'm, I would imagine that you're under the care of a neurologist and that you've been seeing a physical therapist at some point in time. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Has that helped you along the way? No, nothing is helping me. Nothing is helping me. What are you doing right now for to help yourself? Are you seeing any type of therapist? Are you taking medication? No, well, I'm not taking medication. The thing with that, uh, we am, I'm confused because the doctors are telling me one thing, and then when you go back to them again, they are telling you something else. Uh -huh. I'm ask, you, you know, because it's kind of a tricky question, and again, I want you to call, you can call after the show to, the, to my office, and we'll try and set you up. But Dr. Grimberg, have you, I mean, I'm, I don't think any of us have seen anything like this, but you can imagine. I think this is such a unique situation that uh, I think that the, the doctors there are taking care of Ryan are, are stumped because uh, nobody really has experience with this type of um, situation. So it's, it's a tough one. Dr. Stevens. Well, it's a tough one. Electrocutions can cause effects, you know, several years down the road uh, with nerve problems and scarring of the nerves, which may not uh, manifest till several years later. So I would seek, uh, you know, several opinions from several different doctors. And uh, I hope you, hope you yeah. get some help. Hello? Hello? Yes, hi. Who is this, please? This is Joanne. Hi, Joanne. How are you? All right, pretty good. Who's this? This is Dr. Garner. Oh, you... it is Dr. Garner. Hi, how are you? I thought it was the wrong number again. <laughs> how, are you... how are you doing? Hi, how are you? Okay, good. It was nice, nice speaking to you. Good. Where I you watch call... you every, week, every, every chance I get. Oh, thank you. And uh, I've been meaning to ask you this question. You want to know if I'm married? <laughs> No. Yes. Okay. I, I'm listening <laughs> yes. to the television at the same time I'm getting... So I, turn I, off the TV. I have a good question. Okay. I think. What is the normal blood sugar, uh, you know, on a fasting blood sugar for a person who doesn't have diabetes? It used to be 126, and now I'm hearing that it's possibly lower. I don't know. I can't get a right answer from anybody because I... I called a couple of labs, and they most of them have 120, but she was the only one that has 109. Yeah, I'm going to let um, yes. our internist take and care of And also, I would like to know what's normal for triglycerides for a person who doesn't have cholesterol and a normal cholesterol level for a Very person good. who doesn't have it. Let's start with the blood glucose. Yes. So the blood glucose, we used to, years ago when I was in training, 140 was the number to diagnose diabetes based on two tests of fasting blood glucose. Mm -hmm. Then the number was lowered to 126. What right. we're looking at now is around a, under 110. So the under lab that gave you back to 109 is the most current cutting edge numbers that we'd focus uh -huh, on. This way, my book has 109. They call it a shadow area, 110 right. rather. Right, you're getting into the, into the gray zone. We'd rather pick it up earlier rather than later. Yeah, no, I'm we, just, you know, getting, you know, at, most of the time I'm 92, 97. Right. Lately, uh, 110. I'm like 97, you know, I'm creeping up, and I'm just concerned because I have diabetes in the family. What right. about triglycerides? Yeah, well, let's, let's, go to, let's go to cholesterol first, the different okay. types of cholesterol. Sure. Cholesterol, that there's a, a total cholesterol, and that number that we look at, we'd like it to be under 200 for the total cholesterol. Oh, I'm about 217, okay. Oh. Now, but hold, you have to look I'm at the... I'm line on that, yeah. Okay, but that's okay, Joanne, because and we have... And what about my triglycerides? I would normally 83, 73... Now, okay. the last time I was 149, which was a jump from 83. Wow. Okay. Well, first of all, the triglycerides have to be done on a fasting profile. Yes, I mean, you don't eat or drink fasting. for eight hours. I always do a fasting. Okay. Right. And we'd like to see them under 150. So you're still within right, the so normal I'm still range. Good with that. All right. So you're still okay. And again, we don't make a diagnosis based on just one test. So three you can. Three times, then they take an average? I'm sorry? Do they do it three times, the blood, and then they take an average? They'll repeat it. They may repeat it in, in a few months from now. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, but they do at least two tests before you make a diagnosis. Okay. The other thing that you asked about was the cholesterol, and you don't just look at the total number, but it's broken down because we have good cholesterol. Yeah, I don't understand how that works. Okay, I can explain that if Thank you'd you. like. Okay. We have good cholesterol and we have bad cholesterol. Right. The good cholesterol LDL is... LDL and HDL. Right, and the HDL is the good cholesterol. Right. Think of it as HDL, you want it to be high, has an H in it, because it makes your heart happy. Okay, so you'd like that number to be high. And a really good number to target at is Maybe. over 60. Excuse Under me? Over 60, 60, 
is a good number, uh -huh. okay, under 40, then it's not really protecting your heart so well. So those are the numbers you'd like the HDL to be over 60. Mm. For the LDL, think of it this way, LDL, that's cholesterol. Right, 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 that's the lousy cholesterol, so you want it to be low. Naturally. Okay, yeah. and when we look at that, we look at other things, Joanne. We look at how many risk factors an individual has ah. before we say what's their target LDL. Uh -huh. Okay, so we look at someone's age. Okay. okay, and for women, we start to get heart disease around the age of 55. I'm Men 60. get it at 45. Yeah. You're 50. Okay, so you're getting it. I have there. good cardiovascular. I work in the school. Okay, <laughs> so you have <laughs> a lot I get of stress. Good exercise, thank God for that. Well, that's good because yeah. being sedentary is also a risk factor. Excuse then your me? family history, whether or not you smoke, that should be number no, I one gave on the list. No, years ago. Okay, what you stopped. Oh, yeah, 35 so that's years. Almost 40 years already. So, Joanna, that's great. Or Joanna I want you to take these numbers. And, and remember also, if you listen to the, in the news segment, yeah. some of the doctors may be getting that hemoglobin A1C. Yeah, I know, I heard you say that. Yeah, so I, we have to run though, but thanks oh, so thank much for the call. thank you so much, Dr. Gardner. And I think I may have the answer to the... You the may, somebody already called it in. What oh, were you gonna say? Well, I was gonna say, um, plaid. You, were, you would have been right, but no um, next week you're gonna get the prize. Uh, take, take care, Joanne. Uh, Hi, Rosemary. Hello? Hi, Rosemary. Hi, how are you? Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Maspeth. Oh, we got a lot of callers from Maspeth tonight. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> Just refresh my memory about the eating situation out there. <laughs> oh, yes. Look, I have to tell you, yes. my daughter graduated Saturday from St. Francis Prep, and guess where we ate? Parkside. <laughs> oh, very nice. You know that place, Corona. Yeah, did you mention my name in there or you didn't? No, I would have, but I didn't think of it. No. You know who we saw there that was eating there also? Lou Carnesecca. Oh, one of my best friends. I know. Oh, <laughs> Isn't wow. That something? It's amazing. Well, We're going to be going clay shooting with him. And, uh, you know, that clay uh, shooting uh, yes. in Manchester, he's tremendous. Oh, Get, wonderful. It's almost he's, everyone. He's such a nice guy. And his wife, Mary, was there also. <laughs> the nicest people. Very nice. What can we do for you? Okay. My friend is having problems with her stomach. And I was wondering if it might be uh, something to do with her gallbladder. She's having pain radiating from the back around to the front. She also has a lot of pains in her back and some burning. Now, they were treating her. I don't know exactly what tests they did, but they said that she might have some kind of bacteria in her stomach, which she went on antibiotics. But she still continues to have this pain radiating, and they want to do an endoscope on her. But it doesn't it kind of sound like, I only say that it sounds like gallbladder because I had the gallbladder. So, Rosemary, how old is she? 33. Okay, I'm going to ask Dr. Stevens to take this yes, one. Yes, thank you. Okay. Hi, Rosemary. Hi. So, um, it could be all the things that you mentioned are possibilities, I think, mm -hmm. are in your differential diagnosis, including uh, gallbladder disease, gallstones. Right. It could be gastritis, which you were mentioning. That's mm -hmm. the, the bacteria that you were mentioning. Mm -hmm. It could also be uh, pancreatitis, something like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and it depends on the, the exact symptoms. Does it get worse when she eats fatty food? Uh, does it get better when she eats food? So it kind of depends on the story. Right. Um, so I think an endoscopy is not a bad idea to okay. diagnose, to see if there's any gastritis. If it's right in the middle of the pain, right in the middle of the, of the abdomen, then it could be a gastritis. And at least if there's no, no gastritis, right. they can rule out the bacteria. And then if you need to, she can get an ultrasound to see if there's any gallstones, wonderful. get some labs to see if it's pancreatitis. So I think it's a reasonable starting point. Oh, wonderful. Thanks, Rosemary. Thanks for I the call. I love you guys. Thank you. Congratulations on the graduation. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Before we, thank Bye. you. Before we get to Claudette on line two, I have to ask Dr. Grimberger some questions because the men are not getting through to dial an out. And I, I have to know about screening for prostate. When should it occur? Is the PSA useless? Um, and how much of a genetic factor is there? If, in other words, if my father had a problem, will I have the problem? Well, uh, it's been, it's been uh, in the news quite a bit because it's uh, PSA testing and, and, and prostate cancer screening is somewhat controversial, but um, we really believe that it's, it's, it's an important aspect of, of uh, uh, total health care and, 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 and something that we believe is can save lives. Um, the, the American Urologic Association, uh, which is a, the urologic sort of governing body, um, really recommends screening for, for, most, for most men. Uh, now, is there a number, like, like we talked about a cholesterol number, is there a number that I should be worried about? Well, you know, when it comes to the PSA, the, we used to have number four, PSA of four as, as the cutoff, and we know that that's, that's really not a, 
uh, a good way to look at it. The, the PSA is an excellent test, but it has to be taken in proper context. Um, so uh, these days we look at uh, one's age uh, in, in terms of the PSA, because for certain ages, the, the, the PSA levels that we feel comfortable with really vary with the age. So for example, for men in their 40s and 50s, we really would like to see the PSA below the level of two. By the same token, for men in their 70s, for example, if, if the PSA is up to six, that's really not necessarily abnormal. So we look at uh, the, the one's age, we look at the, uh, what we call PSA velocity, in other words, the change over time, so that e each person is sort of his own control. And so we look at what happens with, to the PSA uh, chronologically, because we know that PSA normally does go up somewhat as we age because normal prostate, which tends to grow in every man, uh, produces PSA. So we expect some rise as we get older, that's why we accept different numbers for older men. But if the rise is a little bit more rapid than, than norm, that's, that's what makes us worried. Thank you. We're going to get to more questions about that, but let's go to Claudette, who's been waiting patiently on line two. Hi, Claudette. Hi, how are you? Where are you calling us from? I'm calling from Cambria Heights, Queens. Where is that? I'm not familiar with that neighborhood. Um, it's close to Elmont. Oh, Queens, near, near, near the race track. Yeah. yeah. Did, you, did you watch the race this week? No. <laughs> that was quite a quite a finish over there. Yeah, the summer uh, miner, I think, won that race out there. Another, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm close to where they are. But tell me, what can we do for you? Okay, my shoulder started having this popping, cracking sound, like when you're breaking sticks or cracking the knuckles. And it hurts a lot. And now it goes down to my upper arm. I just have to move it to do any little slighting, and it just make this popping uh -huh. Sound. Did like you have an x ray? are cracking up. They x rayed and they see nothing, but they did an MRI today. And you probably, you're going to get the results in a couple of days? Yes. Okay, let me just, any, anybody want to deal with that? It, it does I mean, worry me that I think my bones are breaking up. You know, a lot of this noise it sounds a lot worse than it really is. Usually some tightening, some of the ligaments and so on. And, you know, um, I was asking about the x-ray to see if there was any calcification that might be causing a problem, but they didn't see anything. And now no. they'll look and see if there's any rotator cuff injury, if the tendons are in place, if the rotator cuff is in place, and what the muscle looks like. And, the, and they'll also get a good look at the bone. So I think you got the right test, and probably in a day or two you're going to know. Now next week we have an orthopedist on. So I hope oh, you're going to, will you call back next week? I definitely will. Uh, and when it, when it does pop, it it's hurts so bad when it makes that sound. Right. It's probably, I'm telling you, it probably hurts more than it is serious, but it's something that we're going to get to after we hear your MRI results, and next week we're going to take your call. Okay? okay so call, call in early next week. week. Okay. Take care, Barbara. We're now going to Deborah. Hi, Deborah. Hi. How are you? Good. Where are you calling us from? I'm calling from Beth of Stuyvesant. How are you doing? I'm doing well. What, what, so what's the restaurant out there? I, I, I got a couple of suggestions. What's your favorite place out there? In Beth of Stuyvesant? Yes. Um, I guess my sister lives in Bethel Stuyvesant, so that's my favorite place. Oh, at your sister's house. Very nice. Yeah, and so, I live in, I live in uh, Clinton Hill. Where's Clinton Hill? It's in Brooklyn, uh, not too far from Pratt Institute. Oh, it's nice. Yeah, very nice area. Yeah, yeah very nice area. What can we do for you? I have two questions, one for me and one for my sister. My question is, I keep taking the water pills, but the water keeps staying in my body. Okay. Is there anything that I could do to get the water out, like anything you recommend? Your swelling, your legs are swelling? Yes, my legs, yes. Okay. Uh, Dr. Stevens, you want to? Well, that, uh, you know, that swelling of the legs could mean many things, Deborah. Um, it could mean that your body somehow is not getting rid of, of the water, and maybe the water pill is not doing its job for some reason. So... I would see your doctor. Do you see a doctor who gives you this water pill? Yes. Okay. I would go back to that doctor, tell him or her that, you know, the pill maybe is not working and you're having swelling of the legs. They may want to investigate uh, your heart to see if your heart is pumping out all the, all the water that it's supposed to be. Yes. And they may need to adjust the dosage of your medicine. So it's not really too simple of an answer, but I would get yeah. it looked into. I think I wanted to ask Dr. Grimberg, how, you know... Problems with women, I know we talk about men, but in urology, do you see problems with either like, they have difficulty voiding or incontinence? 
Yeah, I mean, um, most people think that urologists uh, deal only with men, but in fact, about 40% of our patients are women. And one of the most common problems we deal with are, uh, is, is urinary incontinence, which uh, unfortunately is, is quite prevalent. As, especially and could you define that to people? What, how would you define incontinence? Well, incontinence, basically, simple terms, it means a lack Lose, of control of uh, losing, you, your water. losing your water. Yeah. And a lot of different uh, scenarios, a lot of different causes for this, and a lot of different types of uh, incontinence. So people out there who are having that problem, it can be embarrassing at times. I know that Dr. Grimberg deals with this issue. Maybe people have had a lot of babies maybe at risk and something. Dr. Capozzi, anything did you want to tell uh, Deborah about uh, the swelling? I was going to say that um, just make sure that you're not taking in too much sodium, Deborah, because that can oh. also cause you to retain some water. You're right, the sodium. Okay. So, so Deborah, what's salt. your second question? The second question is for my sister. She's been a diabetic for many, many years, and a doctor just recently told her, that her kidneys are failing her. And is there anything that she could do to rejuvenate her kidneys or keep it from getting worse? Like I, any herbs or anything like that you yeah. recommend? I'm going to ask Dr. Capozzi to discuss that. I, I wouldn't recommend any herbs. Okay. Um, but what I would do is make sure that she, she follows her diet, that mm -hmm. she does not have an excessive, a very high amount of meat protein in her diet, and okay. to stay in close contact with her doctor. Okay. Deborah, okay. two good questions, and uh, you'll give us a follow-up, I hope? I will. I have your number. Oh, boy. I, I tried to keep that prior. Okay. <laughs> we'll talk to you later. Take care, Deborah. Thank you. Y'all have a good night. You too. We'll go to Lorraine. Hi, Lorraine. Hi. How, how are you? How are you? That's a beautiful name. Thank you. The song. You like the song? Sweet Lorraine? Yes, I do. It's a nice Sweet song. Lorraine. Yeah. <laughs> what can we, where are you calling from? I'm calling from East New York. East New York. And we had also a recommendation for a restaurant in East New York last week. For Rhodey? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. Yeah? Mm-hmm. So what, what exactly is that Rhodey? Because not everybody knows. What is that food? What would you call Rhodey? Well, you can get chicken Rhodey. Um, it's chicken with uh, fillet chicken with, with um, vegetables. And it's, it's rolled up like in pita bread. Oh, so it's health, sounds like a healthful type of food, right, Dr. Kaposi? Sounds healthy. Yeah, um, yeah it is healthy. Does it have a creamy sauce on it, Lorraine? Um, you can, it's an option. Okay, so uh, I, would, I would kind of <laughs> limit the amount of creamy sauce that you put on it. Probably a, a, no more than a tablespoon. Yeah. Okay. So, Lorraine, what can we do for you? Okay, my concern is um, bone loss. Yeah, you, are you break? Are, um, you had any fractures? Oh, about a year ago, mm -hmm. I was taking um, Fosamax because I was told that I had a significant amount of bone loss. So, and then I took it for almost a year, and then I went to a medical doctor, and he asked me what medication I was taking, and I told him Fosamax, and he said, "What are you taking Fosamax for?" He said, "Very rarely do black women get." Um, osteoporosis mm. and so he immediately sent for my reading and he and he read it and he said wow your bone density is that of a 25 year old and I was like yes 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 and so I was so happy so I immediately stopped taking it so a year passed another year passed and I didn't take anything so of course my bone loss increased well did you have another bone density test Yes, I did. And that showed it? Yes. And so now it's like up to 25. Okay, I think that, you know, Dr. Capone, it sounds like we have a relatively sure. normal bone density. Okay, um, can I ask you how old you are? I, I was told that I was just at the, the beginning of the osteoporosis. Okay. And how, how old are you, Lorraine? I can't tell. Okay, okay nobody, don't nobody tell, knows. Just whisper, whisper it. I won't tell anyone. I'm, I'm 55. 55. Okay. okay. So, so at that age, we start to lose our bone a little bit faster. You've had the test, and it shows that you have probably osteopenia, which means that if the bone loss continues, which that's the normal sequence in life, is that it will continue, it can go into osteoporosis. So what you can do, whether you're taking the medication or not, Lorraine, whatever the doctor decides to do for you, whatever you decide together, actually, um, is to make sure that you get calcium and vitamin D in your diet. And what you can do is make sure that you, or try to take in three glasses of milk per day or yogurt, and vegetables such as cauliflower and broccoli, um, also salmon with the bones and sardines, those are all great sources of calcium. 
So that's what you can do, and also to stay active. Is it okay to take the fat-free um, milk because the other milk? <laughs> yes, it's okay to take the fat-free milk. Yes, yeah, so you don't need the whole like, yeah. milk. You can take the fat-free milk. So we hope that's been helpful. And okay, we hope you know what? Yesterday the doctor gave me a prescription for Boniva because I was told that the um, Fosamax, there, was, there are lawsuits against Fosamax because people was beginning to develop bone loss in their mouth. Is that true? Right. Yeah, it, sorry. It's a rare complication. It's something that occurs with all of these type medications. And um, I would take the Boniva, if your doctor says to, and keep us informed. We'll check the bone density maybe in a year and see how you're doing. So it's a possibility I could have developed bone loss in my mouth? from. No, no, no. It's, it's actually tumors in them. It's actually destruction of the bone. It's, it's not that common. We're finding... Um, it's reported occasionally, but you can find horrible effects with all medication. And it's not... It's not you always evaluate the risk versus the benefits, and the benefit of taking it usually outweighs the risk. Oh, okay then. Okay? Okay, thank Be you. Be well. Take care. Maria, hi. Hello. Where are you calling from, Maria? I'm calling from Brooklyn, New York. Oh, uh, which part? Uh, oh, God, I don't even know. You have a map there or something? Or <laughs> no. What's nearby? What street is nearby? I'm sorry? What street is nearby? Oh, um, All right, stay in the house for now, but ask us the question, and we'll see if we can send some help. Uh, What's the question? Okay, my question was, what can, how long will my, uh, I had a, a tumor, um, a breast, I had breast cancer. Uh-huh. And uh, as of yet, I don't know if it's going to ever come back again or what. Okay, we have a surgeon with us who, um, breast cancer, and is it going to come back, and what should she be doing? Hi, Maria. So, Maria, uh -huh. when was this diagnosed, your cancer? It was, uh, the cancer was at uh, 2000, 2001. Okay, did you have anything done for it? Did they do any surgery? Yeah, they removed my breast. Okay, and did you have any chemotherapy or radiation? Yes, both. Okay. Uh, and have you been okay since then? Well, I get pains in my chest. Okay. So what, no. I would, what I would do, Maria, is get your regularly scheduled mammograms every year. That's the most important thing you can do yes, right now. Yes, I do that. And keep a close follow-up on the side that was operated on, because you can still get a breast cancer on that side, even though most of the breast was removed. But you can oh, also, really? Yeah. So you know that. So they have to do mammograms on both sides, and you have to get a mammogram on the other side also, because mm. you're at higher risk than most people. So really, you just have to be very uh, vigilant in your, in your follow-up. Uh-huh. Now, another thing. Uh, I had uh, two tumors in the back of my brain, and they did the, uh, uh, what do you call that? Um... Radiation? Radiation, yeah. And were they related to the breast cancer? I really don't know. Mm -hmm. How long ago was that? That was almost about the same time. Well, it sounds... Okay. Uh, also, did they do surgery on your brain, Maria? Or did they no, work? no, no. They, what they did was just give me the... Uh, um, radiation? Yeah, radiation and... Uh, Okay. What's that other one? Chemotherapy? Chemotherapy. Okay. So again, just be very diligent in going and seeing your doctor and being aware of any changes. You know uh -huh. yourself the best. If you feel differently, if you're thinking differently, that may be a sign that something's going on and to see your doctor. But, yeah, you know, but live your life, enjoy your life, and, and see your doctor regularly. Right. I do that uh, every, about every week or two. Good. Maria, it sounds like, though, it sounds good news that it's been a long time. That's, that's one of the best yes. signs. Yeah. So we're really happy for you. Yeah, thank you. I have a uh, pains in my head every now and then, you know? Uh -huh. But you follow up with your doctor, and he'll do the, the workup every, whether it's every six months, as often as you go, and I'm sure he'll stay on top of it. Okay. Now, I have had a mitral valve oh, replacement. But, but Maria, Maria, because I have to move on, but it, well, please call back next week, okay? Okay. Thank you. Hi, Sandra. Sandra? Yes, good. Hi, doctor. how are you? Good, how are you? Where are you calling us from? 
Sunset Park, Brooklyn. Sunset Park, a nice neighborhood. What can we do for you? Good, thank you. you know, if you're listening to your TV, it says there's a delay, so could you turn it off and then talk to us? Is that better? Yeah, now, what's your, what's your question? Um, I have a question concerning high cholesterol. I, um, I've been to my doctor, and um, he said to me the cholesterol numbers is like 301, and he has not given me any prescription yet. Only he says that he doesn't want me to get into the prescription only because I'm a little bit young, and he just wants me to watch my diet, which is most importantly. Now, I wanted to know, um, without he's been you know, prescribed me without medication, would that affect my ability in terms of with heart? Does it both related to high cholesterol? Okay, I'm going to ask Dr. Capozzi to give us a quick answer on that because we're somewhat sure. behind Could in the question. Repeat the second part of the question. She wants to know if it's going to affect her heart the fact that she's not being given any medication for the high cholesterol. Okay, if for the rest of your life your cholesterol remains high and you don't make dietary changes and you're not given any medication, yes, it can affect your arteries and your heart. But I'm sure your doctor is going to follow you closely and make sure that you make changes in your diet, that you stay physically active, and if and when the time is ready, they'll discuss the choices for medication that's the best for you. I, so that sounds like a good answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much. And can I just ask one question to Dr. Ivan? Um, oh, yes, yeah, sure. Okay, just quickly, because I know there is other callers waiting. Um, Dr. Ivan, I just wanted to ask you a question regarding my my, my brain recently. Um, I noticed that most times that when I picked up a book and I want to concentrate, it's very very hard for me to concentrate. I have to like turn the TV off, turn the radio off, and then I have to like read one sentence like ten times before I could finally, um, you know, grasp what I'm trying to you know to read. So I wanted to know if there is a sign of you know, uh, something might be wrong. See, I think that Dr. that's neurology. Dr. Ivan is urology, so that's a different area. Oh, sorry. Dr. Urology, if you had a problem with urinating, Dr. Ivan could help. But this is neurology, so you want to see a neurologist. If you call us later after the show, we'll give you a referral. Okay, great. Okay, thanks Thank a lot. You. You got me confused. I didn't know that you were talented in that area as well. <laughs> but the, I have a question because, you know, we have the big audience out here. They wait a month to come into the studio. And they want to know, the guy keeps getting up at night to go to the bathroom five, six times. How much should he be worried about it? And then the medications that you hear about, does it interfere with the sex life? Well, uh, when, when a man starts getting up a lot at night, it's usually uh, the most common cause of this is an enlarged prostate. And it's a first, one of the first signs of an enlarging prostate. And, um, it, and it's, it should be definitely checked out. So if, if, if if a man notices a significant change in a pattern where he gets up, maybe he's used to getting up once a night to urinate and now all of a sudden he's getting up twice or three times a night, that's something that should be checked out because it is a sign of an enlarged prostate, which most of the time is a benign situation, but it, if it's left untreated, it can uh, cause significant problems. Um, so there, you asked about the medications, and, and, and there are uh, basically two, two different types of medication that we use for enlarged prostate. And um, the, the effects on sexual function, uh, the one type of medication, which are called alpha blockers, and, and the, maybe a lot of viewers are familiar with the names Flomax or Uroxidrol because we've all seen the commercials, um, they don't interfere with sexual function. But uh, the Flomax, which is the most commonly prescribed medication, can affect the ejaculation. So, mm -hmm. that the, so, it, so while men's sexual function is not affected, when he is sexually active and, and has, has a climax, he may not notice that there is no mm -hmm. semen or, or this, the amount of semen that comes out is, is limited. The other type of medications, which are uh, called 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, these are medications that shrink the prostate. And what's a common name that they would know? Proscar or Avidar. Okay. Uh, these medications, the most common side effect is erectile dysfunction or impotence, but it's only about 3% of patients. So it means 97% of patients are not affected sexually with these medications. Thank you. I guess in risk and benefits, deciding which is the right medication. Absolutely. So I know the guys out there, that Dr. Grimberg is the man for this because he really is at the top of the game. I, you deserve that New York Magazine award. <laughs> now let's go to Alria. Hi, Alria. Hello. Hi, that's an interesting name. Alria? 
Hi, actually, no, this is Susan. I'm calling for her. She gave me the phone now. Oh, but it was Alria originally? Mm-hmm. Where did, where's that name? What's the origin? American. American. Alria. Very interesting. You ever hear of Alria? I never we heard We never heard. It's a beautiful name. Thank you. What can we do for you? I have a question. Um, my friend was recently taken to the hospital because she had severe pain in her right side, and it felt almost like a heart attack. She couldn't breathe. Um, they did a CAT scan at Lutheran in Brooklyn, and... Um, the CAT scan came back that she had a 2.5 centimeter um, stone in the gallbladder. Now, our question is, do you necessarily have to have surgery with that being you only had one attack, or can you live with it with medication and proper diet? We both work for doctors ourselves, so we're very picky, and we're asking all the doctors we work with who would they use if it was them or their family, so we're losing our minds a little. Well, I'm going to give you someone I would use, Dr. Stevens. Oh, that's what he does? He's general surgery? General and laparoscopic. Uh-huh. So okay. let's see what he says. Okay. Hi, Susan. Hi. So this was, uh, was this you or was this your friend? No, this was, this was me. But oh, she was, we were okay. So, and this was your first attack? Yep. Okay. And the pain was pretty bad that you had to go to the hospital? Doc, I thought I was having a heart attack. All right. So they saw one big stone in the gallbladder. If, if I were you, I would recommend uh, taking out the gallbladder for a few reasons. Number one, that pain, I'm sure, was excruciating. Uh -huh. I don't want to go through that again because it's pretty scary. Right. Uh, number two, that stone can pass, well, it could, first of all, block the duct that drains the gallbladder and cause a bad infection, cholecystitis, okay. infection of the gallbladder. Okay. Number two, it can break into little pieces and block the pancreas and cause pancreatitis. Okay. So anytime someone has gallstones and they're causing problems, including pain, we usually recommend that it gets taken out. And nowadays, with, with uh, laparoscopic surgery, it's uh, relatively... Uh, common and simple procedure. You usually go home the same day, so I would recommend you have it out. I have another question for you, Doc, if you don't mind. Sure. Well, quickly. Okay. How long are you usually out for the procedure, providing no complications? Well, that's all relative. Everyone's different. Some people feel good enough to go back to work in... No, no, I mean out d during the procedure. Oh, how long does the operation take? Right. Generally about an hour to an hour and a half, usually. Okay, because my thing is anesthesia. Yeah, well, uh, it's, it's usually very well tolerated. Most people do really well with it. Okay, and what hospital are you affiliated with? Well, he's, we're gonna, you can get his number off the, at the web, you know, on the screen, and we'll, we'll get that information to you. Thanks okay. a lot. thank you. Have a good night. Yeah, I mean, the doctors appear here because they want to appear, and not always, you know, not for getting any extra patients and so on, but this is really dedicated people that we have, so thank you for coming. Edna? Yes? I want you to hold off one second, because I have to ask Dr. Grimberg it's with the stone issue. Guy or girl's got a stone in the kidney that's causing a blockage, severe pain. Is it, when, when do you decide lithotripsy versus having to go in and take out the stone? Well, we, we almost never do open surgery for, for kidney stones anymore, but we do have several options. And, and lithotripsy, which, which refers to breaking up with a machine from it, that we use shock waves sound from the outside, yeah. sound waves, um, is the easiest for the patient, and, it, and it's, it's non-invasive. But it's not for every stone. So the... the uh, the factors that determine whether we use that or other approaches is uh, the size of the stone and also location and, and a degree of uh, uh, blockage. So if the stones are less than two centimeters, which is in about uh, two-thirds of an inch, then we can treat these with lithotripsy, and that's, that's very easy is for the painful? patient. Is it painful, the lithotripsy part? No, it's, it's usually done with a little bit of sedation, so, so the patient's got an intravenous, and, and it's almost uh, the same type of um, sedation you get when you go for colonoscopy. So. So patients really don't feel any pain at all. Great. So let the trips. Edna? Hi, Edna. Hi. Sorry, we had a little conversation going on here. What can we do for you? Yes. About a year now, I was, I'm feel, hearing a ringing in my ear, and I get some drips down my ear. And my doctor is telling me it's my sinus, but this ringing like a bee in my head, and this draining, so I okay. want to know what is the cause of this. So, um, Dr. Capozzi, sure. ringing in a rear sinus problems? Just, did you say it's just ringing, not running down? You're just ringing in your ear? And no, I just hear, I just feel the running in my ear. Like if you know you have. Drips dripping in, so in my ear. Fluid of coming my out. Ear. Okay. It, it could be that you have fluid in your ear and that's causing you to have the, the ringing sensation in your ear. It can also change your hearing, your ability to hear, and it could be also contributing to your sinus problems. Um, but for just isolated, are you taking aspirin, by the way? No. 
Okay. For just that isolated ringing in the ear, it's called tinnitus, and there are actually doctors that treat just tinnitus. If you call back or just go on the internet and look tinnitus, you can find someone who treats just that. So that's a problem that's common, disabling. Yes. It's very, it's, it's not deadly, but it, you know, it's something that can be very annoying. Uh, so you want yes, to make it's sure. Very, it's very annoying because my, oh. I just hear the ringing constantly, constantly. I know you keep answering the, no, but the, the question is, you want to rule out anything serious because right. it can occasionally be serious. So it's important to go to the doctor, let him order the tests, and after that, you'll find ways to deal with it, okay? But we've got to run on because the questions are, are moving. We only have a little time left, okay? Okay, thank Thanks for you. calling. Hi, Andrea. Yes, hello. Hi, how are you tonight? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Thank you. What can we do for you? Um, basically, this question is for Dr. Grunberger, who is a urologist. Um, my best friend, who is a 35-year-old male, has a high PSA, and this has been going on for a couple of months now. His, he's 35, in, relative, in good health, uh, active and everything, but his PSA is coming back at 4. And the, and the doctor's at a loss as to why. Could there possibly be some kind of insight that Dr. Greenberger has? Well, I know it's a good question, and, and it's a situation we deal with uh, quite a bit. We think of uh, uh, elevated PSA as being an older man's uh, issue, but it's not necessarily so. Uh, yeah. The important thing to realize is that uh, the elevated PSA is not, doesn't necessarily um, mean there's, there's cancer. There are other things that can elevate PSA, such as infection, inflammation, the prostate, and sometimes se sexual activity for 24 to 48 hours. Yes, um, he's already, he's already um, been on antibiotics, and that brought it down to four. If, if he's, if he's, uh, but if he's uh, in his 30s yes. and, and his uh, PSA remains near four uh, mm -hmm. and, and he's been treated with antibiotics, then that's definitely uh, a, a reason to do it, consider biopsy. And really biopsy, the process should be done at this point. Is that something that's okay. done as an outpatient? It's just something that's done in the office, so it's a very simple okay. procedure. And, and regarding a biopsy, I mean, something that it has been suggested to him, which he will go to after a second opinion, um, is how long will that take and is it painful? He's a little hesitant, obviously, for a biopsy, but he'll do it. Well, you know, the biopsy is really a, a quite simple. It's, it, it takes about five minutes. Done in, it's in, done in the office. Mm -hmm. We use local anesthetic that, that uh, numbs things up. So it's, it's a little bit unpleasant, but it's not really very painful. Thank you so All much right. for the call. I've got to move on. Adam, you're the last caller. What can we do for you? Yes, I'm a... Adam? 59-year-old. Yes, that's yes. me. 59 years old. And I have um, terrible baldness in the center of my head about the, the size of my hand. Okay, and you have a, in the a baldness in the center of her head. Yes. And how long is this? Not, not in the front, towards the back. Towards the back, okay. Right. How old are you? 59. 59, do you have any medical problems? Um, not really, that okay. I know of anyway. I'm gonna let Dr. Capozzi give the final 30 second sure. answer. Um, okay. This is a new problem for you? It is. Okay, is it a little patch or a, or a big center? It's a big patch. And I know, don't know if my mother nor father have been bald. I'm and sorry, neither mother, the parents have neither been parents have it. Is there any type of a rash there? Something that looks like um, something that's raised or like a ring, anything like that? No, it, it, it wants to feel like sometimes like I'm having an itch. Itchy. Okay, what I would do is and I would like, see... Like, or like a parasite. Like a, it's like a parasite. Okay. Uh, I would see your primary care physician, have them take a look at it. If they can't get to the bottom of it, I would recommend a dermatologist and or to have We've some got to stop at this point. Okay. Adam, I'm sorry. We've got to rush. Call us back next week. Uh, the show just flew by. We, I think we need another half hour in this show. But um, that's it for this edition of Ask the Doctor. I want to thank Dr. Bob, Robert Capozzi, Dr. Ivan Grimberger, Dr. Daniel Stevens for coming in. We hope we've been able to help you. It's good to remember that you should be proactive about your own health. Speak to your doctors about your concern. Go for second or third opinions. In the meantime, continue to watch this show every Tuesday night or visit our website at ny.net slash askthedoctor. There you can do many things like watch, you can watch special video blogs, see past episodes, if you didn't get enough of this show tonight, or send in questions. And I want to thank you for all your calls, and I'll see you again next week at 8 p.m. Goodbye, stay healthy, and we'll see you in the tablet. <laughs>